All right. Hello, my name is Jenna Baker. I am from Rodell, and I'm so excited to have everyone here, um, especially Alice Medridge, to lead us through this long weekend baking masterclass and make her chocolate and vanilla bean tart with fig compote. I'll be back on later to talk more about Rodell and our cocoa and vanilla. Um, we're just keeping it quick, short and sweet here. So I'll turn it over to Annalise. All right. Welcome so much. Uh, we can't wait to, to bake with you today. So um, I want to invite you to bake along with us. And if you do on social media, we'd love to see what you're baking. Feel free to tag us at, at Valley Fig, at Alice Medrich, and at Rodell Vanilla. That would be fantastic. Our hashtag for this class is Long Weekend Baking with Alice. And I also wanted just to let you know, um, ask your questions, put them in the Q&A box and Jenna will be the one who's looking at those questions and we'll be asking Alice throughout the class. So we are enthused to have you here on behalf of Valley Fig Growers. Um, we can't wait to share our figs with you and this really exciting recipe. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Alice Medrich maven of so much. <laughs> um, I always learn something new from Alice and I'm thrilled that we get this opportunity to bake with her and to get to learn from her. So Alice, take it away. Thanks Annalise. I'm excited to be here too and welcome to my kitchen. Welcome so much as Annalise just said. Um, we have not so much a lot to do but a lot of timing to work with. So I'm going to jump right in here and there's going to be times to ask questions, you can put it in chat um, and somebody will feed them to me and there'll be like moments here and there. But I wanna jump right in here with this big tart with this crust so we can get it in the oven on time. So if you have your mise en place and if you're not baking with us, it's fine. You're gonna learn a lot of tips and tricks from watching and listening. Everything is quite simple, but there are, are lots of tips and tricks. So I'm gonna start off with the tart. We're gonna skip the compote for the moment and go right to the tart crust in order to get it into the oven. So I've got flour and I measured this all out in grams, um, but you have volume measures too and we sent it to you in grams and cocoa. It occurred to me as I was doing my prep today that cocoa is sometimes um, a little lumpy. You can mash it out with a spoon before you dump it in here just to make sure it doesn't remain lumpy. And then that will mean that you won't have to sift or anything. Here's my sugar. And you wonder what this dirty spot in the sugar is. This is my secret way of not forgetting vanilla, which of course today we do not want to forget. I sometimes sneeze it right with the vanilla in there and a little bit of salt. So, oops, everything's sticky. So while I'm about to whisk that together, but meanwhile, the sort of magic of this crust is that it's done in a saucepan. And I have six tablespoons, 85 grams of unsalted butter in here. And I'm just gonna melt it in the saucepan. I don't wanna, I don't want it to boil. I don't want it to evaporate all its water. I want it to be nice and hot, but not simmering, okay? We're not gonna fry or saute or anything. We just want nice, hot, warm butter. So while that is happening, let's just get back to this dry mixture. Honestly, I don't know how, Mise en place has become my best friend these days, um, just in order not to forget everything. So I use that vanilla trick a lot. If vanilla is gonna go into a cookie and I'm afraid I'm gonna forget it, I just mise it out with and just pour it over the vanilla. Okay, so this is the tart stuff. And this is all the snow boiling here. Okay. So you can see in here, I ooh, do what I say, not what I do, right? That's the rule. So the beauty of this crust is there's just enough for the tart pan. There's no rolling out, no worry about getting extra flour in there by mistake from rolling it out so it won't toughen. Um, there's no excess, there's exactly the right amount. So I can control your tart crust without even being in your room. Um, and it's all press in, so let's see. In goes the dry and it goes, it gets made in the, after saying everything is so perfect, I lose a bit, clean counter. So we're gonna mix this together and it's gonna make a really dark, gorgeous chocolatey paste. So different from any tart crust you've ever made, I know for sure. And this is gonna give us a really tender, very chocolatey, thin as though it had been rolled out crust. And I'm gonna show you how to do it. In fact, I think that the um, possibly the most challenging 
thing about everything we're doing today is pressing the pastry in the crust. And it's just a matter of a little patience and believing that there's enough because you might not think at first that there is. This big and vanilla project prompted me to create a brand new crust for this class. I've never made this before. I mean, except for this recipe, of course. And it's kind of a spin off of my favorite plain melted butter tart crust. So, so as soon as this is just a cohesive paste and it's quite warm, but not hot, you wanna reach for your tart pan with the removable bottom and just push it in there. It will be warm, not hot, so don't worry. And you just start to mush it around and hey, Alice, here. while you're mushing, we had a question come in. Um, sure. Why put the dry into the butter versus the butter into the dry? Oh, Any such benefit? a good question. <laughs> um, in order for this to be handleable and get it to be pushed around to a really, really, really thin place, it's nice that the whole mixture be warm. So if we put the dry into the fairly hot pot, we make sure that this tart dough is warm enough to push like Play-Doh all around the tart pan. So you can see that at first you're going to think that, thank you for that question, really good one. Um, at first you're going to think, and I do every time myself think, oh my God, there's not enough. What have I done? But you know, the crust hides in the corners, so you can just move it to where you need it. And I told you this is maybe the most challenging part of the whole thing. It's just the patience to push into the corner, up the side. And another thing about all tart, uh, sugary, uh, you know, sugar crusts. This is a pat, a, a, a tart, a sweet tart crust rather than a flaky one. Is that when you come up the sides of the tart pan, you want a, a sort of a leveling off at the top. You don't want it tapered because edges cook quickly. And if you have a tapered crust, then those edges are going to be what burns. So make sure that your edge is, let's see, I'm going to show this to you when it's done. So it still looks a bit of a mess. Don't worry. Still working on it. Just move what isn't, what's too much into the bottom. And you'll feel better doing this without an audience, you know, without the ticking clock, so to speak. So, okay. The beauty of doing this with cocoa rather than chocolate is that it's going to make a really tender crust, tender and crispy, and a little bit sweet, not too sweet, whereas chocolate, which we all love, would never make such a tender crust as this. So I'm going to now whip out my secret uh, method for, I don't know how many of you are doing this with me, and if it takes you longer, so be it. It's kind of worth it. The secret method for getting this almost perfect is to put a piece of plastic wrap when you've got things pretty much where they should be, but they're not even. And then a paper towel. I know this is peculiar, isn't it? And then you need a, like a, a cylindrical straight sided with a pretty good corner cup. Like I use a measuring cup or if you have a glass and we're gonna use this to slide all over the paper towel and especially into those corners. And it's gonna give you a tart crust that is as thin and even as though you had expertly rolled it out. I know this. Meanwhile, you have your oven preheated. I should have mentioned that, huh? to 350 with a rack in the lower third. And you're gonna expect the crust, let's just check the edges here. I have a reputation for being fussy about details. So here we go, right? I just want those edges nice and high and level. But let me see if I can show you how even, almost rolled out even and thin this is, can you see? And that's just all the pressing around. And then just to make sure it doesn't um, 
puff up in baking. I'm gonna prick it. Ooh, don't scar it, just prick it. Okay, so I'm gonna disappear for a second. I'm gonna bake, just because it's easier to handle, I'm gonna bake on a rimmed sheet pan so it doesn't fall off and so I can handle it. And it's going to that 350 oven for about 20 to 25 minutes or whatever your recipe says. Okay, so. Okay. Alice, this is one little detail question that came through sure. that I think Wait. is a bigger detail question. Um, Cheryl wonders if there's any difference in using natural cocoa and Dutch processed cocoa for the tart crust. And you can do either. You get a slight. Um, it's a good question. You can you, you'll get a slight. You'll get a different color and a different flavor. And it's a fun. It's a fun comparison to make. Right. Did I cut you off, Jenna? No, I was just going to say um, I'm partial to the Dutch process because that's what Rodell offers, but right. <laughs> that's why I let you field the question. Okay, that's good. I will also tell you that because I'm doing this with Rodell especially, and I was enjoying the cocoa, this um, recipe was developed specifically with this cocoa. So I haven't tried it with natural cocoa, but I, I doubt that it would be a, a sort of, the amounts should be about the same, but you will get some different flavor differences. So um, that's in the oven, that, that should be in the oven, what did we say, 20, we're gonna check it 20 minutes. Somebody needs to remind me of that because I have no timer here. So I wanna just get started on the fig compote for a second, okay? Um, this is something that you can do ahead. In fact, it, it gets even better with time. You can do it days ahead. I even have um, bits of fig compote from testing a month old in my fridge and it's still pretty delicious on, on yogurt and that sort of thing. So what I did was I did the first step, which was to cover or to bring the water and the, and the ordered stemmed figs to a boil. And then I just let them soak for an hour. So let me just show you how I did that. Super easy. Here's the figs beforehand, right? And to stem them, I just cut off whatever the little nub is that's a little bit hard on all of them. And then for the tart, I thought the smaller pieces were good. So I cut in quarters. But if you're making this compote for another reason or just love the look of the half figs, which are the most beautiful, um, just leave it in halves or you can chop. You can do whatever you want. This is a really, really versatile dish. Okay, so this is how I prepared all the figs that are now in the pot over here, covered and soaked for an hour. And so at this point, well, I'm just gonna toss them in even though they will not have been soaked because whatever, you know. I'm gonna put in a little sugar and I'm going to split the vanilla beans. Now, this is a recipe, we're, we're being luxurious with vanilla here because we have it and it's delicious. So I, I'm gonna take this moment to show you how to split a vanilla bean. For this recipe, you don't have to do it horizontally like this, but I'm gonna show you how it's classically done. Keep your fingers out of the way. You press that knife. Can you all see? Press that knife to, it's like filleting the bean. If you don't feel you can do that, especially for this recipe, just cut it any way you can because all the seeds inside are going to fall into the compote anyway. And I don't even bother usually getting, um, separating the seeds for this particular application. But if you were making something when you wanted the seeds, a tiny little spoon, to just shovel all that, all those vanilla seeds, scrape them up, get a lovely amount of it. I think we were calling it vanilla caviar these days at Rodell, right? Yes. And anyway, this time it's all going in there. But this compote could also, if you have spent um, pods where you've already, um, you know, simmered them or infused them in something else, you could put spent pods in there. Or you could do what I did, scrape out the seeds, put the fresh pods without the seeds in there, and then use the seeds in the filling of the tart, if you wanted. Um, so what else is going in here is some aromatics. In this case, three really wide strips. While you're stripping that orange down, um, Irvin wonders if you can make the compote with fresh figs when they're in season. It's a different... Um, procedure because you won't need want to soak or cook them so long. I'm dying when they're in season to try mixing the fresh figs in with this like towards the end of cooking. But I mean, we're going to end up cooking these longer than you would fresh figs. But I think the combination of fresh and dried would be really, really nice adding the fresh towards the end. So what else is going in here besides the vanilla? 
and a strip of orange and the sugar. Oop, tiny pinch of salt. I sometimes forget. And then when I taste, I remember. Um, I'm gonna juice two oranges, the one that I made the strips with, of course, and one more in there. Alice, thoughts on citrus aside from orange? Yes, um, I've worked with figs a lot and I love their sort of dusky, wonderful, deep, lower note sweetness, but I often find, I often, often find that I want a hit of acid to brighten them, to kind of make those flavors pop. So I sometimes use lemon, I sometimes use orange, orange and zest, lemon juice and zest, whatever. If you go online, especially probably on Valley Figs, you'll see that I've done various versions of fig with, um, fig with citrus over the last several years. So at this point, I think everything I want in there is in there. And then you're gonna put it on the stove and I'm, I'm not gonna bother with this now because it takes a while. And you're gonna simmer it until the syrup is somewhat reduced and maybe the, maybe the consistency of a light, uh, what do you call it, maple syrup. And then knowing that it will thicken more and also the figs will absorb it, then take it off and chill it. And that's it, um, that's it for now. So let's put that aside. I'm gonna, in a second, hand things over to Annalise to talk about figs, but I think I will, if I have a moment, show you what happens when it's done. It's kind of syrupy. I use both colored figs, because why not? I had them, right? And you can too. And um, so this makes a good sauce for the tart. It makes a good standalone compote or a compact to which you might dollop some yogurt or some cream or some ice cream or what have you. Very useful and very, very long lasting, gets better with age. Um, let's see, if there's no question about, more question about fig compote, I think we can turn this over to Annalise to talk about figs. It's all Annalise right now. Great, and Alice, just so you know, I've got you, um, I've got the timer set for you. So you've got about 14 minutes and 42 seconds. Excellent. Great. So Jen, if you can highlight my beautiful, love it. All right. Well, Valley Fig Growers welcomes you to the orchard virtually. A little bit about us. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Located in, nope, yep, thank you. Located in the fertile San Joaquin Valley, our fig grower owned cooperative is one of the largest handlers of figs in North America. We have 30, grower members, and they represent about 40% of the California fig industry. Paul Mespley, chairman of Valley Fig Growers, is a fourth generation California fig grower. In 1959, his father was a founding member of the Valley Fig Grower Cooperative. The Mespley family came to the Central Valley from the little town of Isere, found in the foothills of the French Alps in the 1900s. Ending up in Clovis, California was fortuitous for the brothers. They all became farmers and began their life's work. Next slide, please. California figs have two harvest seasons, but the beauty of California dried figs is they are always in season. The first crop, while minor in production, matures in late June and is typically used for fresh figs. The dried fig from this first crop has a longer stem and is used almost exclusively for fig paste. The second crop ripens later in the summer and produces 90% plus of the total crop. Fig production is a year-round business. We are continually preparing the soil, monitoring irrigation, and pruning the trees for maximum yields from the orchards. Next slide, please. So the soil and climate in the San Joaquin Valley are ideal for growing figs. Figs thrive in the valley's hot, dry summer sun and rest in the cool, wet winters of the Central Valley of California. Our figs sun dry on the branch to harvest perfection and are later packaged and sold as sun-made and orchard choice California dried figs. Unlike other tree fruits or nuts, fig trees have no blossoms on their branches. The flowers are inverted and actually develop inside the fruit. So those many tiny flowers produce the crunchy little seeds which give figs their unique texture. Next slide, please. Now, when you think of dried figs, the flavor that comes to mind for you is probably black missions. Mission figs have a robust fig flavor and a deeper sweetness. We liken them to red wine or dark chocolate and they stand up to bold flavors like blue cheese. If you have never tried a golden fig before, 
you were in for a real treat and I'm so happy that you received some golden figs in your, in your kits. Naturally sweet, golden figs have a tender skin, delicate sweetness and slightly nutty flavor. Our golden figs are a mix of Sierra and Amber Tina varieties. You'll find their flavor reminiscent of brown sugar and vanilla. We liken them to white chocolate or white wine. Next slide, please. Red figs have so many health benefits, but we wanted to call out two of our favorites. Eating one half cup of figs has as much calcium as drinking one half cup of milk. Good news for our dairy-free friends. Ounce for ounce, figs have more fiber than prunes and more potassium than bananas. You can find more health benefits in dried figs at valleyfig.com. Next slide. Dried figs are a versatile ingredient with deep roots and cultures around the world. For the purposes of our baking class, we are highlighting a few baking collaborations with some of you. Our California dried figs are great for baking, like the hazelnut fig bunt cake with chocolate ganache from Bakes by Brown Sugar, or the fig orange swirled bread from Buttermilk by Sam. Then there's the chocolate macaron with thick fig and rose buttercream by Jam Lab and the banana fig layer cake with mocha frosting from Vintage Confections. Our California dried figs are great for snacking, cooking, and cheese plates too. Thanks for letting us introduce ourselves a bit to you. We have a hunch you will love our plump orchard choice and sun-made California dried figs. Now I'm going to pass the baton back to Alice so we can finish up our fig compote. And Alice, to that end, I will, uh, I'll let you know when the, the crust is ready. Thank you, that's perfect, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm gonna catch up on a few things that I speeded sped through um, that you might have questions about or that I should um, add. About the crust that we made, if you hate the idea of having to fuss with the size of a tart pad or you just wanna make squares, that amount of dough will um, fill up, say a nine by nine square if you wanted to make little tartlet squares and then you don't have to go up the sides, you can just press on the bottom. Um, and that works, that works fine. Also, you should try making a cookie out of that dough. I haven't done it yet. Roll it into a log and do a slice and bake. I have a feeling it will be very delicious. Back to the figs. I also wanted to say that the, you know, the figs are simmering away over here. You won't see them because they won't be done um, when we are done. But um, that recipe, uh, highlights two things. I tried a lot of different things with the figs to make them into a compote. And I found, even though they were deliciously, wonderfully candy-like and moist, to get the texture right to go with the tart, I ended up doing this one hour soak in hot, in hot water first. And I just found that gave the figs the right texture inside. Who knows why? I don't know. Um, but it just was better. And I ended up with lots of little figs, figgy samples, figgy bowls in my refrigerator. Um, for the first day or two, and I ended up on that. You can take that procedure and make any fig compote you like using that as a kind of a blueprint. You can try some different aromatics. You can try lemon peel instead. You could throw some um, whole cloves or even peppercorns in there or cardamom pods. You can take it in some different directions. Don't forget that little pinch of salt and don't also worry about how much water you're put in, putting in in the first place. It's all gonna be cooked away. And if you cook away too much and it's too thick, you can add some back. I find myself, because it, it smells so delicious while it's simmering, I find myself walking over there and tasting all the time. And I sort of, you can stop cooking when, when that syrup tastes good if you like. Alice, uh, how about boozifying? How about sure. putting bourbon or whiskey? If you want to boozify, you might add that towards the end or at the very end, depending on whether you want the alcohol to stay put or not. But what a great idea. Good idea. I mean, it's very versatile. It's more cooking than baking, that compote. It's, you know, put it on the stove, taste it, have an idea, put it in, um, pour some booze in it at the end. Um, so we're waiting now. Are we going back to... Um, Let's see, what are we doing? What else can we talk about? Do we have questions? Two questions. Those were the questions that have come through. Um, we've had some great feedback on figs over here. Lots of golden fig fans, which is surprising to me. I'm only familiar with the dark ones. So um, I need to get out to the store more. I think most people feel that way after last year. 
I'll also uh, suggest um, just to, to throw this in there. Um, we have worked with Alice before, and I would definitely encourage you check out her arugula recipe. Her arugula, the filling in particular, it's it's got the warming spices that you expect in the fall. So I believe we added a little bit of cinnamon with the orange zest and the the pastry for those is so flaky. So that's a wonderful recipe. There's also um, since we're headed into ice cream season, we have a spiced golden fig um, white chocolate ice cream on our um, on our website too. So I would definitely suggest that that's another one to uh, to check out on. Yeah, it's always interesting working with these dried figs. What kind of texture you want with the ice cream? I wanted that sort of chewy candied um, kind of texture, but with the compote, I wanted a sort of a tenderness almost between fresh figs and and the candied figs and. You know that's what prompted the soaking. It's like there's no end to what you learn doing this. And equally for the tart shell, um, translating my favorite melted butter tart crust into chocolate was interesting too. You know, to figuring out what the you know the ratio of cocoa to flour should be and what the you know how much to uptick the sugar. At first, using my usual rule of thumb, I just sweetened it about the way I would sweeten something with cocoa, adding just equal amounts, and it was too sweet. I mean, it was just too sweet. And it was causing the tart to, it was causing the filling to liquefy the sugar in the tart and it was dripping all over the place. And so it just occurred to me that cutting that sugar way back because the filling is sweet and the, and the compote is sweet. It's all that game of balancing flavors and textures, which I love so much. Alice, we had a great question come through for you. Who was your influence to be a baker? Oh, golly. It's so long ago. <laughs> you know, You're I, such a I, natural. I, I did love Julia Child. I'm a kind of a self-study person. I read a lot of books. I try a lot of things. My formal education is very, very, very brief. Um, you know, Julia Child, Simone Beck, um, Carol Field. Um, there was a marvelous book long out of print called uh, by Paula Peck, who was like a she was like a passionate housewife who wanted to replicate European baking because she, she'd lived in, I forget where, France or somewhere. And she went about learning it and she translated it into a book and I learned so much. I learned so, so much from it. I'm sure I'm forgetting some people who were important. No more cocoa or tart questions? We have a few. Um, I'll ask uh, one about figs. What is your favorite fig pairing? Oh, I like figs and prosciutto and savory stuff. Mm. Um, I like figs and spices and even as you've seen, and if you look at the body of, of, of work I've done with figs, I like that sort of citrus and aromatic combination with fig. I like figs, fresh and dried and always, always, always have. Um, I have a memory of being in Yugoslavia when I was about 20 driving and there was a lonely little lady on the road with a basket of figs. That's all she was selling, a basket of figs. And I remember my husband and I saying, yeah, how, could, how good could those be? But we stopped anyway and they were the best figs. They were the best things we ate all week, those little figs. I mean, she just had a handful of them practically. That's it was awesome. good stuff. Um, one question about the crust. Uh, um, we recall that you've mentioned you could turn it into a log and cut it into cookie discs. Would you recommend adding any inclusions like white chocolate chunks or fig pieces? And if so, I know that you may not have trialed that. Do you have a recommendation on length for baking the cookies? Um, you know, roll it into the, the, the dimension that you want your cookies to be. So it's more about the, 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 the diameter than it is the length. Um, and again, I haven't tried this, so I don't know. It might be an eight inch log. Um, it's meant to, I think it's gonna be best as a crispy cookie. So I'm not sure that fig bits will go in there. However, as with many crispy things, if you bake them less, and this could be one of them, it might also make a nice um, moisture chewy cookie. So the figlets, little bits of fig might be delicious in there, white chocolate chips, whatever. You could roll the log in some coarse sugar just to give it a little finishing touch. Um, you could do it really thin and use it as a sandwich, cookie, lots of things. Once you have a good cookie or a good tart crust, I mean, it can go in so many different directions. I kind of believe with many of my colleagues that one good recipe equals 100 if you just make it work. 
Awesome. And this might lead us back into the filling. Um, I know we have that slated for today. One um, participant wondered if you could use whole regular yogurt, whole milk regular yogurt instead of Greek yogurt. Um, I have not done that, I don't think. And I'm I'm a little concerned that it's the, the texture might be too loose. Maybe if you added an extra, a little less yogurt and an extra egg um, or an extra yolk, that might work if in a pinch. I mean, just the difference between the Greek and regular is the amount of water in there, right? And uh, we don't want a filling to be so loose that it won't set. Great. Do you want to talk a moment about um, your first cookbook and any of the other ones that um, you think the class would uh, like to dive into? I know that when you get the ebook, everyone, you'll see all of Alice's cookbooks on her um, bio slide, and they're all available on IndieBound. Okay. Just to highlight really quick, uh, you've got one minute left for your chart crust. Okay, so and um, let me go look at it, okay? I think I should look at it. It's probably about ready, and then I'll take you to that next thing. Before, uh, before we get it, let me go back to the recipe. Now I've wandered off a bit. Um, I, will have made, I will have mixed up uh, a yolk plus a half a teaspoon of water and a little pinch of salt, and we're going to use this to... Um, to waterproof this crust so that the filling doesn't make the bottom soggy. I always think it's a sign of a great tart when you cut through it, you hear the crunch on the bottom. That's what you want. So I'm gonna go, go and get that thing. I think it's done. And I'm gonna tell you what to look for. Yeah, we're gonna call this done. So it looks set, you won't be able to see, and it's kind of dry on the surface rather than moist. Keep your, um, I don't know, can you see that better? Um, keep your mittens handy because don't get like feeling that this sheet pan is not hot because it is. So let's see. So this little egg wash, do not feel that you have to use all of it. There's more of it than you need probably about half and you're just brushing a thin layer. I had a thought this morning while I was doing this that I'm going to try this sometime. You know, you were going to have some of this left over and nobody likes to throw away a little leftover egg. One of the things you can do is save it for tomorrow and put it in your scrambled eggs, but it occurred to me, frugal housewife style, that you might be able to throw it back into the filling and just have a little yolk, extra yolk in there, but I haven't tried it. It's a good idea though. This is going back in the oven for a couple of minutes. And that's just to set that waterproofing. You know, it's sort of like we're doing a masonry here <laughs> to protect that crust. Um, I have completely lost what I was about to say. Okay, so I'm, I'm timing you for three minutes and you're going to start telling us. Okay, just give me about... two. Just give me two. We're fine. Okay. You were going to tell us about your first cookbook. Uh, yeah, my first cookbook was born out of my, my pastry shop, Coppola. And so I think what was, mar what was remarkable about it at the time is it tried to translate very, very professional looking and very, very professional styled um, uh, recipes into something a home cook could do. And I guess it was successful because... Um, it, it, the book was very, very, very successful. And the, the, if you look at the photos, although the settings are very old fashioned, the photos are you know, elaborate and pristine. Since that time, and that was like 1990, that's been a lot of years I've been doing this. But as I was no longer in the profession and no longer had a pastry shop after a while, or shops as it turned out, um, I started thinking more like a home cook and realizing that nobody wanted a recipes that had 18 mixtures and took two days to, to do, which is something that's easy in a pastry shop when you've got all these mixtures going on anyway and you just run around and grab from here and there. So I started simple, thinking in more simple ways. And so every cookbook since then has been more, um, more geared to what it's like to cook at home. I mean, maybe you're busy, you have a job, you have kids, whatever. Um, and I've kind of enjoyed that. I've enjoyed the simplification of things, not dumbing things down, but keeping things elegant and simple and rethinking and reworking. 
Um, and and um, I've kind of continued to do that. I also love to tackle new ingredients. Um, uh, my latest book, my last book was about non-wheat flours and it was a new topic for me. And I, I took the um, opportunity to sort of approach it with a beginner's mind in a way and to not, and to try not to pay too, too much attention to um, what others were doing with gluten-free. You know what? I'm having such a good time talking. I think I should make the filling for this tart because it's going to have to go in there in a minute. So hold that thought. I have three eggs. I have some sugar and a little bit of salt. And I'm going to whisk them. Now, this kind of whisking is not meant to put air in there. So keep the whisk on the bottom of the, on the bowl, bowl, against the bowl. If you go ka-chunk, 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 like you're making whipped cream, you're going to get air bubbles. And that's exactly what we don't want here. So people don't think that there's different ways of whisking, but they're definitely this. In goes the yogurt. This messiness is because I've done that thing again where I put the vanilla in there so I don't forget it. And if you'll notice the recipe, I'm particular about what goes into what. And it's yogurt into eggs rather than eggs into yogurt. And for some reason, it makes a smoother, better mixture. And that's perfect timing because the alarm just went off. <laughs> I told you, Annalise, that I could go wander off in many directions for hours on these topics. So, okay, tart shell out. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Okay, turn your oven down to 325. Here is, is the tart shell with its uh, sort of mastic like protection. And, uh, in goes the filling. I think the recipe says spread it, but you will see that there's, well, maybe sometimes there's a little spreading that can be done. It's pretty liquidy, but it's got eggs to set it up. It's really kind of like a not too sweet cheesecake. So I'm gonna stick it back in there at 325. For 15 to 20. Annalise, you're in charge. So a couple of things I wanted to add. You'll notice that I, or I'll tell you, that I cooked that tart shell till done. Um, even though it's going to get a filling in it, it's going to be back in the oven at a low temperature for another um, 15 to 20. I have never in my life found a tart where you pre-cook only part way that really works. Because if you pre-cook that a tart shell only halfway with the idea that it will finish cooking after you put the filling in, you're probably wrong. The tart shell doesn't tend to continue cooking, believe it or not. So you end up with a, a soggy tart bottom or a raw tart bottom. So over these years, um, one of the things I didn't mention is one of the things I did in my career was to do overhaul the significant baking chapters in the 1997 Joy of Cooking. That was like to a, two remodels ago. And it was thrilling because I learned so much going over all of those American recipes and either sort of vetting them or improving them or reworking what needed to be reworking with you know, current knowledge. And one of the things I, I found then, improved again then, was that the partially baked tart shell really kind of doesn't work. You have to fully bake it. Um, if need be, sometimes when you put it back with the crust, and with the filling in it, if the edges want to, are starting to get too brown, you can mask them. It's a pain in the neck, but it beats having um, a raw tart bun. So this is back in the oven at a slightly lower temperature. And like a cheesecake, we don't want to overcook it. Also, it's kind of thin, right? So we definitely don't want to overcook it. And so it's going to go in there 15, 20 minutes. I think we should check at 15, Annalise. Um, and the idea is that the sides will appear kind of set if you wiggle the pan gently don't slosh it don't hit it hard but we're going to wiggle it gently i hope to be able to show this to you and what we're looking for is not a liquidy center that looks like it's sloshing back and forth under the surface but one that looks like very very gently set jello or gelatin <laughs> so that's what we're looking for because um it firms just like cheesecake it firms up as it cools 
And if you overcook it, you will lose that silken quality about it. So we're gonna look at that again in 15-ish uh, minutes. And I think Jenna is gonna talk about vanilla and cocoa. Yeah, I'm ready. Um, I think Jenna will pull up the slides. And uh, um, it's been amazing to see all of Rodell's products in your home so far, Alice, and especially in this <laughs> tart. I'm sure all of us can't wait to try. Um, so next slide. I am excited to pull back the curtain and share more about um, our products and just want to give a little intro to Rodell first. We are celebrating our 85th anniversary this year. We've come a long way in terms of technology and innovation, but have remained rooted in quality and flavor since 1936. The company changed hands a few times since the beginning, and our biggest change happened in 2018 when we were acquired by ADM. ADM brings a global backing that has only helped us get closer to our farmer partners in Madagascar in a really impactful way and continue to streamline our vanilla supply chain there. Um, we'll touch on that in a few minutes. So if there's just one thing to take away from this little intro here, it's our wide availability in traditional retail grocery stores and online. Um, so definitely recommend visiting our website later to find out more details um, when you run out of the products that are either um, with you now or um, in the near future. Next slide. If you're shopping for Rodell later in the year, be aware that we're in the midst of a brand refresh. So our beautiful new packaging will roll out to shelves in the second half of 2021. Next slide. And now um, just a little bit more about Coco. Next slide, please. Rodell offers gourmet um, Dutch processed baking cocoa in both organic and conventional varieties. Today, um, Alice is using the gourmet or conventional variety. As most of you probably know from being experienced bakers, Dutch processing is when the cocoa powder is treated with alkali to remove the acidity naturally present in baking cocoa. Our treatment process creates a rich finish and deeper chocolate flavor than a natural chocolate powder. And I feel like it lends itself um, to almost all baking applications. Next slide. Our gourmet Dutch processed baking cocoa also boasts a higher cocoa fat percentage than some of the commonly available cocoa powders on the market. At 16 to 18%, you will really notice the richness of flavor compared to some of the other lower fat percentage cocoa powders, making it ideal for um, sauces, icing, smoothies, and savory recipes. We even have a couple of chili recipes on our website that will knock your socks off. Since Rodell's cocoa powder is full fat, like Alice mentioned earlier, there can be lumps. So if you're a purist, you might wanna whisk it through a strainer before using to your recipe. Um, and another tip on baking with Dutch processed uh, baking cocoa, if your recipe doesn't include any leavening or uses baking powder, you can choose any cocoa. Um, next slide. This uh, is a little bit about um, vanilla. Next slide. Vanilla is extremely complex, contrary to those plain vanilla connotations out there. There are hundreds of flavor components that naturally occur in vanilla beans. The flavor wheel on this slide shows some of the main flavors in vanilla, from floral to creamy and fruity and sweet brown notes, to those further deeper descriptors that we use to describe the complex flavor and notes in vanilla extract and vanilla beans. Another thing to know about vanilla is that the FDA actually controls vanilla extracts to a particular standard of identity. So outside of vanilla bean extratives in water and alcohol, if someone wants to call a product vanilla extract, it can only have a couple of other specified ingredients like sugar, or glycerin, or corn syrup even. The standard of identity even states the minimum amount of vanilla beans and alcohol percentage that must be used. Because of that standard of identity, the formula is pretty set for vanilla extract manufacturers. To make our extracts stand out and be the best flavor they can be, Rodell controls the elements that we can, um, our extraction process, our hand selection of vanilla beans, and even blending in different origins of vanilla beans, which takes us to the next slide. 
Vanilla grows in tropical climates, 20 degrees north and south of the equator. Madagascar consistently produces about 80% of the world's supply chain for vanilla um, and is the predominant species of vanilla called planifolia, also referred to as bourbon vanilla. And here bourbon refers to the islands, not the beverage. Tahitensis is the other type of vanilla species used in food and beverage applications and is primarily grown in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is the second producer, second highest producer of vanilla beans, um, but it drops down to about 20% of the supply chain there. There's even a third variety of vanilla called Pompana, and that is mostly used in fragrance. Next slide, please. Vanilla has an extremely long growing cycle that is very manual, making it the second most expensive spice after saffron. So this is the growing cycle in Madagascar, where from 12 months of the vanilla opening to the beans being cured and available for export. Some growing regions like Uganda get two flowering cycles within one year period. Flowering in Madagascar happens in October, November, and each vanilla orchid must be hand pollinated within 24 hours of opening or it will not produce fruit. The vanilla beans grow on the vine for about nine months and then they are hand picked and um, cured in the harvest process. And they enter into a traditional sun curing and sweating process until September. And then we hand them again um, individually in September, October to do the um, grading process where we separate out gourmet beans that we've been baking with today that are plump, moist, and have a high vanillin content, producing the best results in baking and ice cream. Extraction grade beans are what we use to make the extract. They're commonly drier and may contain splits or breaks, and they're rated in quality from most flavor in vanillin, which is the biggest flavor component in va vanilla, to the least. Next slide, please. I mentioned this earlier, but one of um, our greatest strengths is our supply chain and traceability and infrastructure in Madagascar. And it's personally one of my favorite things about working for Rodell. Next slide. As this slide shows, many other extract manufacturers go through several steps in the supply chain before vanilla beans even get to them. Um, from there, they might be even bottled and sold by another company. Um, through our work um, prior to the ADM acquisition and with ADM, we've removed the middlemen and complexities of the traditional supply chain to bring um, our customers vanilla directly from the source. Our direct from farmer vanilla is not only better for the crops, but as you probably can imagine, also better for the farmers, allowing a bigger percentage of value chain back to them. We're also the first company that was fully traceable via mobile technology back to the farmer. And here you can see small, the Savon logo is actually our joint venture with Sahanala and ADM. And our um, Madagascar vanilla source through that joint venture, Savon, is available under the Rodell brand and then also commercially under the ADM brand. Next slide, please. This is a, um, a large handful of Sahanala members. This slide shows one of the Sahanala member meetings. Sahanala is that farmer co-op that we partner with in Madagascar. It's made up of over 4,000 farmers from 18 different associations, mostly concentrated in the northern tip of Madagascar. Um, we do have some farmer presence in the southeastern corner as well. Um, Madagascar is the fourth largest island in the world. It's also one of the um, most uh, um, challenging, I think, due to the lack of infrastructure. So some of the farmers travel for days to meetings like this um, to help combat that, um, that challenge with the infrastructure. We employ through Sahanala, a team of extension workers that regularly visit the farmers to simplify communication, trace product and exchange information from the association to the farmer and from the farmer to the association. Next slide, please. This is just a quick screenshot of what our um, traceability system looks like. Um, the wonder of phones uh, um, helps us connect with those farmers and create that first um, mobile enabled traceability system back to the farmer. Next slide, please. 
Our joint, part, our joint venture and close partnership with Sahanola actually also allows us to further impact the farmer association. So all members receive fair market prices as well as an incentive payment that they can apply to um, community initiatives like new schools, new churches, new wells, and we direct our social impact towards medical care, food security, and education. Also offering trainings on agriculture, agronomy best practices, and biodiversity. Um, I'm really passionate about it, so if you have any questions after the class, feel free to reach out to me. And I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity to talk about our vanilla and cocoa, um, two of my favorite flavors. Back to you, Alice. Thank you. I'm noticing how interesting it is that the vanilla growing region is the same as the chocolate region, 20 degrees north and south of the equator with the possible exception of uh, Hawaii. I don't know if there's any vanilla in Hawaii, but that just, you know, that just shows that the things that grow together go together. Yes. Um, I'm going to, while we're, I'm hoping to show you exactly how wiggly that tart should be at the end, and it's still in the oven, but fortunately, of course, I have one pre-baked. And so we're gonna unmold it. One thing I did not mention, which is a very good tip for all tart baking is about 10 minutes or so, or within the time while the tart is still hot out of the oven, it's not a bad idea at all to gently loosen the tart sides. Because if there's gonna be any sticking, it will unstick while the tart is warm. But once the tart gets cold or cool, anything that's sticky might prevent. Now I haven't had this tart stick, but I do it anyway, I'm superstitious, you know. The one time I don't do it is when there's gonna be sticking. So, okay, this tart is cold. I made it this morning. Oops. And I'm just gonna put that down here. It looks good to me. And I'm gonna cut it with a big sharp knife. Inflate it, and I'm going to hope to hear that crunch at the bottom, signaling that we have a crunchy uh, bottom, so y'all can see. Ooh, it cuts nicely. I heard it. I don't know if you did. So you want to definitely get that knife all the way down through the tart shell at the bottom, and you will hear it. Okay, so. should come off the bottom perfectly. You notice that the tart pan was not greased and was not needed to be greased. And let me just show you the clean cut. To the extent it's not clean is where I didn't put my um, knife all the way down. So beautiful clean cut. I'm gonna spoon a little fig, figgy goo. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put some pieces and some juice because it's all good. You can always drizzle some more juice on the plate. All right, Alice, the timer just went off. Okay, that's perfect. So let's have a look at, let's see if it's the right level of jiggliness now. So darn close. I mean, I could also maybe call this. Let me see if you can actually see it. Can you see a jiggle? It's swaying. It doesn't look liquid. I can see it. I'm going to call it. If in doubt, another minute won't hurt. But can anyone see? Is the light such that you can see a swaying? I thought I saw a little shimmy. Oh, it's too bad. Well, that's the one thing about June. So to describe this, think of barely set gelatin so that when you see the movement in the center, it doesn't look liquidy. It doesn't seem like it's liquidy underneath. Barely, barely set gelatin. So it shimmies and shakes. I'm checking it out. Why not? Our participants have said that they definitely see the shimmer and wiggle. So we love it. Okay, good. Yeah, I think bakers and dessert people, we know about shimmer and wiggle. So, I mean, I feel like, thank you all so, so, so much for coming. This has been a great pleasure. The only thing better would have been to have you in the kitchen, actually, see all your faces, hear all your questions. Um, but I've had a lot of fun. I hope everyone else has too. I wondered if I could just go back and remind you what I used. Um, there was lovely number of vanilla products for me to choose from here. So I went lavish and used whole fresh vanilla, bean, not fresh, but whole unspent vanilla beans in the compote. And I told you how that could be changed. 
I used vanilla paste with its little seeds in the filling and vanilla extract in the tart shell. And one can change that up like crazy. One could use uh, the seeds from a pod in the, in the filling instead. And, you know, I think I covered that before, but so I hope you'll do this. I hope you use the crust for other recipes. I hope you use the compote for other recipes and other occasions. So thank you, Jenna, Annalise, and Jen behind the scenes. Yeah. And everybody yeah. for coming. So we look forward to seeing your tarts. Um, please go ahead and share them on social and tag us. Alice, I know she would love to see the shimmy and those really sharp edges. <laughs> if some of you decide that you're going to uh, go the cookie route, you yeah, plant that seed, Alice. I mean, you did plant that seed. Um, yeah, we just have appreciated having you here and just know you, you'll get a, a copy of this recording um, very soon. Is there anything else we should do in five, in four minutes, three minutes? Yeah. Well, okay. So I think it was um, Sevtap earlier who was mentioning about your cocoa brownies. So if we have a oh, moment, yeah. you and I were talking about the uses of cocoa and how yes. it's like, it's an ingredient that really deserves like a good focus. So, you know, it's magic. Cocoa is magic, especially when you have good cocoa like this, it has a good fat content and really good flavor. It's like a magic chocolate ingredient that gets left behind and not paid attention to because we all love chocolate. And we all think that if it's going to be something good, it's going to be chocolate, not cocoa. Cocoa has a sort of a lesser reputation, but it's not true. Cocoa can do things that chocolate cannot. It's like a magical ingredient belongs in your pantry. What can cocoa do that chocolate cannot? It can make a tender, um, a tender soft cake in a way that chocolate cannot. It can make this crispy, tender, crispy yet tender tart crust in a way that chocolate cannot. Um, and believe it or not, uh, those of you who follow me at all know that I probably have dozens of brownies between books and the internet, but one of the ones that has been most favorite and is one of my most favorite is made with cocoa. And you gotta start with good cocoa, of course, so then you get a lot of good flavor. But what's special about the brownie is because when you use cocoa, you use less of it than you use chocolate. You also have to add a lot of butter to make up for the cocoa butter that you're not using that's in the chocolate. And as a result, because butter is softer than cocoa butter when it sets up, you get a softer brownie. It's definitely worth doing. It doesn't have to be your, only brownie. It's certainly not my only brownie, but it's the one, one of the ones I am most proud of. Um, there's a brown butter version of it somewhere on the net from mm. what magazine? Bon Appetit years ago. Uh, it's been on Food 52 in various guises. There's all sorts of little tricks and turns and you can totally make it your own. But cocoa belongs in your pantry for sure. Yeah. And I try the cocoa with figs and you'll be like, amazed it's really mm -hmm. like I'm thinking of making those cocoa brownies with some like of our of our golden figs maybe tiled <laughs> on top oh, yeah, yeah. that'd be so good mm. yes I wonder what would happen if you put like whole figs in in the brownie so that there's like a whole fig in the center of each brownie or that'd be really fun you know, so that would be a, fun to slice instead into of, instead of a fig with chocolate in the center it's sort of a brownie with pig in the center <laughs> I love that idea I think I also you know my first book was reissued and they wanted a no, 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 that's not true. Uh, never mind that. But I did, in some book or other, I did a fig stuffed with cheese and dipped in chocolate. That was very delicious. Anyway, so many things to do with these ingredients, some of my favorite. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. On behalf of Valley Fig Growers, we're thrilled to get to bake with you. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I want to see those parts. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, everyone. This has been the best work day I've had in years. <laughs> Thursday baking. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.